Good morning. It is good to be together in worship today for those who are here and those who are worshiping online. It's good to be together. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, we're looking for volunteers in a couple areas. Uh, please uh, consider signing up to help out with Coffee Hus. The sign up is down in the fellowship room. Also, we are in the need of folks who are willing to learn how to become videographers. Uh, so if that's something you might be interested in, we could certainly use your help. Uh, and please contact the office. Also, our uh, Rotary Interact Club, Maggie Stevens is a part of it, is uh, doing a collection of items for Afghan refugees. Um, we did this earlier in the year as they were coming to Fort McCoy, and now a lot of these families are transitioning into permanent housing, uh, particularly down in Green Bay. So there's a box out in the narthex, and there's a list of things on there um, that you can donate. Uh, the request is that these need to be new items, uh, brand new items. There's some things at the end that could be used, like appliances and stuff. But, uh, but please, consider bringing by your donations so that we can help out the Interact Club as they do this important work, uh, welcoming new members to our community in Northeast Wisconsin. Also, if you look at the bulletin, we are uh, going to be offering a Lenten devotional series. Uh, it's called Good Enough. It's written by Kate Buller and her partner, Jessica uh, Ritchie. It's a, a wonderful opportunity, a daily devotional throughout Lent. Uh, you can access it online. Uh, we can also print up uh, copies of that for you. There's also a companion book to go with it. Uh, but if that's something you'd be interested in doing and making a commitment during this Lenten time to be able to do this uh, together. Also, um, we will be having kind of a kickoff event, informational event, that uh, Sunday before Lent begins at 4.30 down in the dining room. So. We look forward to that. Also, we are so grateful as we see the uh, COVID infection rate continue to go down. Uh, so we're hoping that we will be moving to masks optional very soon. Um, just think about that. What did you give up for Lent this year? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we will keep you informed about that, but we're very, very encouraged and, and looking forward to being able to then to get back to some important things like Choir. So, uh, finally, ask for your prayers for Mimi Zengrabe, who's uh, suffering from another back injury and is, is laid up right now, um, and she is requesting your prayers. Also, for Mary Aiken and family and friends, her cousin Karen Johnson, who passed away very suddenly, and wish to support them with our prayers. And then, finally, for the family of Jim Benish, uh, Coach Jim Benish, who we've been praying for for these many months as he's been dealing with cancer. Jim passed away in the hospital down in Milwaukee yesterday morning. I, uh, we will share with you arrangements as soon as we know. With that, let us prepare our hearts to be in worship. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We gather this morning in this place of worship to offer hymns of thanksgiving, our prayers, our worship to the God who is majestic, who cares for us. Let us stand as we sing together from the renewed. 
hymn book number 47. Please remain standing and we turn to the Moravian Book of Worship where we will be praying together the church litany on page five. We will be singing all parts.
from all sin, from all error, from all evil. Gracious Lord. From famine and disease, from disaster by fire or flood, storm or earthquake, for war and bloodshed, for the violence of wicked people, from the pride and trust in our own wisdom and strength, from needless worry and anxiety, from the selfish desire of becoming great, from hypocrisy and fanaticism, from envy, greed, hatred, and malice, from the deceitfulness of sin, from the power and destructive ways of Satan, from the influence of the secular spirit of this world. By your holy incarnation and birth, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by all the merits of your perfect life before God and humanity. By your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and suffering, by your sacred wounds and precious blood, by your dying words, by your atoning death, by your rest in the grave, by your triumphant resurrection and ascension, by your sending the Holy Spirit, by your prevailing intercessions, by your holy sacraments, by your divine presence, by your coming again to your church on earth or our being called home to you. Head and Savior of your body, the church, unite all the children of God in one spirit. Send us as faithful laborers into your harvest, that all may be gathered into your family. Pour out your spirit and power on those who preach your word. Prevent division and useless conflict in the church. Put far from your people all who deceive. Bring back all who have gone astray. Defeat the evil intentions of those who oppose and persecute your church and help them to turn from the error of their ways. Grant love and unity to all our congregations. Keep our bishops and ministers sound in doctrine and holy in life. May everyone who serves in the church be faithful, not only in great manners, but in the smallest things. Grant that all of us may pattern our lives after your example, that we may be your holy people to our life's end. Hear us, gracious Lord, Lord, supply the needs of your people. Bless our labor and make us diligent in our daily tasks. Do not let any of us become entangled in the affairs of this life, but may everything we do or think be for you. Help us to make proper use of your gifts and make us generous in our giving. Help us to be loving and caring in all our relationships. Be present in our homes and guide us to bring up our children to love and serve you. We pray for ourselves, for all Christians, for the people of Israel and Islam who are close to us in heritage and faith, for persons of every religion that we may all come in a fuller knowledge of your truth and love. Grant success to the witness of your gospel throughout the world, that all people may come to know you as Savior and Lord. Lord Direct all governments in the way of justice and peace, that your will may be known and done among the nations. Bless those who hold office in our land, and may we lead under them 
peaceable, godly, and honest life. Deliver us from the sins which lead to war and conflict and strengthen within us the will to establish righteousness and justice on the earth. Enable us to make wise use of the world that you have entrusted to us. Good Shepherd, we commend to your care those of our congregation who are absent from us today. Watch over those who travel. Send help to all who are in danger, trouble, or anguish. Strengthen and support those who suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. Protect and provide for the poor, the hungry, the homeless. Support the aged. Bless and heal the sick and the afflicted. And in their suffering, comfort them with your love. Enable the dying to put their trust in you as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Have mercy on your whole creation. Hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become your kingdom. And by grace, make us worthy to stand before you. Please rise. fellowship with the church triumphant in heaven and let us rest together in your presence from our labors. Time, uh, please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come join me. And I hope the TV's working in the nursery. Oh, it is. Oh, good. Come on down. Come on down. Come on over on this side, you guys. Come on over this. Some of you come over here. Thank you, Graham. Yay. Okay. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. So in Sunday school, you're learning about Paul and Timothy, correct? Now, who was older, Paul or Timothy? Oh, I tricked you. So Paul was a lot older than Timothy, and Paul was mentoring Timothy, right? So, you know, it's funny because we have different names in the, in the uh, animal world for animals when they're little. So we're going we're gonna to play a game. So I'm going to give you the name of an animal, and then I'm going to give you an option of what that name may be when they're little, okay? And so I'm going to tell you, you're going to stand if you think it's one thing, and you're going to sit if you think it's another, okay? You ready to try this? Okay, <laughs> the first one's an aardvark. Do you even know what an aardvark is? Yeah, I do. 
<laughs> yeah, I didn't know that one either. Okay, so this is just a gamble here. So you should stand if you think a little aardvark is called a calf, or stay seated if you think it's a pup. What do you think? You don't know? All right, everybody stand seated. Well, you were wrong. No, you were right. No, no, you're wrong. You should have stood up. It's, it's, a, it's a calf. All right, how about a bear? Now, you should know this one. You get a stand if it's a cub or sit if you think it's a fuzzling. All right, okay, there you go. Good, you can sit back down again. It is a cub. All right, how about a duck? Stand for a chick, sit for a duckling. Oh, good job. It's a duck. It's a duckling. All right. Ooh, an eagle. Stand for an eaglet or sit for a chicklet. <laughs> I, I thought chicklets were little things that you chewed on, but okay. No, it's an eaglet. Okay, so you can sit back down. Ooh, kangaroo. Everybody know what kangaroo is? All right. All right, stand for a kit or sit for a joey? Oh, it's a joey. It's a joey. Okay. But it was fun to stand up, wasn't it, Graham? All right. All right, here's the last one I'm going to try. A platypus. Do you know what a platypus is? <laughs> this is quite a list of animals. Stand if you think it's a puggle or sit if it, for a paddle. Ben was committed, and Ben is right. It is a puggle. All right. So, yeah, so we have different names for animals when they're little. But the, what you're learning about Paul and Timothy is that there is a name that can be given to all of us regardless of how old we are, and that is a leader. All right? And what you're learning about is how God raises up leaders in the church. And the thing is you are never too young to be a leader. You are never too young to do the right thing. You're never too young to learn how to be a good example for others and to be loving and kind. So all of us are going to work on being good leaders together this year um, and as we're studying this in Sunday school. So go home and study your animals, and we'll see how you do next time, okay? Thanks for coming up.
scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I have to tell you, when we pray the the litany like we did this morning, I often feel when we get done, it's covered everything. We can just go home now. So... (laughs) So, uh, as last Sunday, we are back to the Sermon on the Plain. What Brian just read for us is a big laundry list of virtues that Jesus is telling his disciples in this large gathered crowd that, that they need to aspire to in the living of their lives. He is also giving a very stark contrast here between the ethics of the kingdom of God versus what the world is like that we live in. Jesus' words are they're countercultural, regardless of the age in which they were spoken or in the age in which they are being read. What he is asking of us is not the way of the world. He is calling us to a different set of rules, a different law, rules of forgiveness, patience, forbearance, and kindness in the face of those times when we may be mistreated or shown none of those things from others. The rule laid out here is not to react to our mistreatment in kind. We are called to be living examples of God's grace. I've been watching a a new show on HBO called The Gilded Age, It's about very, very wealthy, upper-class people that lived in New York City and Manhattan in the late 1800s. In this story, the old money, old society people who claim they all came over on the Mayflower, which we know is probably all a lie, but that's how they see themselves, and they're desperately trying to keep the new money, the land barons of industry, out of their social circles. It's kind of fascinating to watch people who lived within these very strict rules of etiquette and polite society and how they would speak and talk about things, but they were still absolutely horrible to one another. They just seemed to do it with a lot more class. There was a shiny veneer covering their malice. We read these admonitions of Jesus today and we can't help, I think, but reflect that there seems to be no veneer right now on our contemporary malice. The rule of today, when faced with the circumstances that Jesus is describing, is not to rise above and to go in the opposite direction. No, today we live in a time of the double down. Be belligerent, angrier, more self-righteous, claim to be a victim, demand your rights. What is so deeply disturbing to me is that some of the people who justify this terrible behavior we see going on in the greater world today, identify themselves as Christian. 
It's as if they have rewritten these words of Jesus to say, curse and vilify those who curse and mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the tree, cheek, you have a right to pull a gun and gun them down. If someone takes your coat, then take them to court and do your best to destroy them. Judge and be suspicious of anyone who asks you for help. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, get it back double from them. Do to others before they do it to you. Jesus is making the argument here about the true nature of love. That we are not to do those things. In fact, we are to respond in difficult circumstances with this forbearance and patience and grace. But he goes beyond that to point out to us, you know, the true nature of love is this. If you love those who love you, well, what credit is that to you? You see, the gospel law of love is that it must be freely given to all. As God has been patient and merciful to us, we are called to be patient and merciful to others. Even, even if they don't care, even if they don't respond, we are called to live these virtues. Now, I don't know how you react to these verses, but I have to tell you, I find them very challenging. For me, if I'm reading this and taking this seriously, it's challenging. I know that in any given moment, I can fail at so many of the things that are described here. We've been doing a lot of baptisms in this church. And in our baptism and confirmation liturgy, the second question is exactly the same. This is what we ask parents and sponsors who are either getting confirmed or being there for their child. We ask them, do you in this faith turn away from sin, evil, and selfishness in your thoughts and actions? Let's think about that realistically, what that question is asking. I have to say, every time I ask that question of those individuals, I can't help but stand up here and think that I need to be asking those questions of myself. Do I turn away from those things? What's my success rate? The law of love is that it must be shown to all people. But in practice, it is also hard work. We need sometimes to be reminded that we live with great pressure today, pressure to be perfect. Such love takes practice. I've been thinking a great deal about Coach Benish since I received the news yesterday morning of his passing. I've been reflecting on the many years that he's been in our lives, how he touched the lives of our children, how he touched the lives of so many children in this community. I couldn't help but think a lot about the hundreds, probably thousands of hours that man spent in a gym with a whistle between his lips, practicing, practicing with his basketball players. Jim was not the kind of coach that he was on for the season and off after that. It was every day, all year round, that this passion was a part of his life. All those hours drilling and drilling because, because friends, it's in practice that the game is mastered. We need to remember that. It's not on the court of competition. It is in practice that it is mastered. With dedication, he did this because of his love of the game and more importantly because of his love for his players. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive. These things take practice. The law of love is also something that we have to work at, to practice in ourselves. Those who argue that religion is merely creation of human beings to give them comfort clearly have never read these verses and taken them seriously. What Jesus is demanding is radical. I was reading recently about Mahatma Gandhi's early years in South Africa, and it was interesting to me because, you know, these great icons of uh, nonviolence and, and who battled for social justice. So often we put them on a pedestal and, and we forget. You know, this beacon of nonviolence and tolerance and forbearance, he didn't come out of the womb that way. 
There are many racist opinions found in his early writings when he was in South Africa. But they do not reflect the man that he became. You see, friends, the law of love deserves our effort, and all of us need to work at it. The point is that we try. And the point of trying is not perfection, but it's transformation. We try and fail, and we try again, because such ideals are worthy of our effort. Because we have received the love of God, and we hope to pass it along to others. One of the reasons we've chosen to offer out this Lenten series is to encourage uh, people to engage in this idea of transformation during Lent. You know, our culture, especially under the influence of social media, burdens so many people now with this idea of perfection, that we have to have perfect jobs and perfect marriages, children, social relationships. But this is a false goal that we are chasing. We should be engaging in building virtues in our lives, not to be perfect in the eyes of others or even to God. We build virtues in order that we may be transformed, to be better, not for the sake of perfection, but as a reflection of the love that's been given to us, the love that has been showered upon us. And so I encourage all of us to remember that it is in the practice, it is in the effort of our daily devotion, our daily study, our being together in worship, that hopefully when those moments come, when we are faced with these challenges, we will rise and we will do to others as we would have them do to us. Amen. Please stand as we sing together our closing hymn from the Moravian Book of Worship, number 401. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and abide with you, both now and forever.